The following presentation was recorded at the 2014 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2014 for helping make these videos possible. All right, everyone, thank you for coming to SSH and Friends. Your speaker is Bill Farrow, Senior Embedded Linux Engineer, Beyond Electronics Corp. Welcome. Um, yeah, as my name is Bill Farrow. Um, I work at a small startup company. We do embedded devices, and I'm the guy who writes the Linux device drivers and the rest of the stack, if necessary. Um, generally, our customers write the rest of the stack, but uh, that's what we do. So this is just to give you a bit of background about um, why I use SSH. Um, my company builds boards like this, uh, PowerPC chips or ARM, um, generally a PCI bus of some sort. In this case, we've got fiber optics. It's conduction cooled, so there's no fans. There's no, no airflow over this device at all. Everything, all the heat is sucked out through metal clamps out to the outside case and out to an external cooling system. We shock and vibrate um, this device to make sure that nothing pops off. So you've got a big shaker that shakes the hell out of it. Um, you want to make sure that your chips don't fly off when, uh, you know, when you, when it, for example, if this goes into a train system and the train's going along the tracks, you don't want your processor to shake off eventually. Not good. Um, sorry. Um, we also do high temperature testing. So my software has to work, well, the board has to work over high temperature ranges. So 80 plus degrees down to minus 40. Good fun stuff. Um, sorry, I'll go back. <laughs> Got my notes. Um, I started in using Linux back in the early 90s, around about the time when Doom came out, if anyone remembers Doom. No. Um, back then we loaded Linux, Slackware Linux up on 30 floppy disks, and that took a, quite a while. And then if you wanted X Windows, that was another 30 disks. I don't know if anyone remembers that, but it's, uh, we've come a long way. OK. so. SSH is used at home. I, I use it at home every day. Um, I don't know about you. Anyone else use SSH at home? Yeah, good. At work? Yeah, OK. Cloud, 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 cloud. Linode, Linode, Linode. And then it's also used in, in embedded devices. Everything from what I do to smart grid, your TV has an SSH server in it. Uh, it's probably blocked, but it's there. Um, my clock radio has SSH. I can SSH into my clock radio and change the time. Uh, it's good to be SSH. All right, so an overview of the talk. We're going to cover today how to use SSH. I'm not going to go into the type of encryption that's used. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of how SSH is written. I'm going to go into how you guys can get more out of using SSH in your day-to-day -day work. Because I bet you're not using it to its full extent. And I bet you're not using it efficiently. So I'll cover basic usage for anybody who hasn't used it before. Um, I'll cover some of the other tools, like Secure Copy. Uh, we'll do some key, key generation and tell you a bit more about how to use keys. Config file is the big time saver for everyone. Who uses a config file for SSH? Uh, OK, about 50%. Who uses X Windows tunneling? Ooh. Yeah, OK, good. And authentication forwarding. Mm, less and less, all right. All right, some history. Um, it's been around for a while, 1995. It was a open source project back then written by this Finnish 
guy, I'm not going to pronounce his name, Tattoo, yeah, anyway. Um, he, he started up, he got about 20,000 people using it, and then he went to a proprietary model and made it closed source. Um, so in 1998, there was a, the BSD the guys forked the old open source version and created OpenSSH. And that's generally what most people use today. Um, in 2006, uh, we, they, they uprevved the protocol. Um, it, SSH version 2 is not compatible with version 1. Um, it became uh, an I, IETF standard. Um, and there was an RFC, uh, RFC 4253. And I can read the intro to that. It says the secure shell is a protocol for secure remote login and other secure network services over an insecure network. Now, everyone raised their hand over using this at work and at home. Do you consider those networks insecure? Your home network insecure? Do you trust your work network? Yeah. <laughs> Few hands. Um, so, who uses Drop Bear or BusyBox? Yeah, okay, so that's another variant of the SSH server and client tools. Um, it's Dropbox is a slimmed down version. It doesn't support all the features, um, but you can fit it on your TV. Um, you can fit it on embedded devices and Internet of Things type devices. All right, Telnet. That's what came before SSH. That's what everyone used back in 1969 onwards. Who uses Telnet? One, two, three, four, oh, oh, a few more. Okay, good. Telnet's old, very old. Stop using it. Um, you didn't ask what we use it for. What do you use it for? Troubleshooting mail servers. Is it testing? Yes, that's it's perfect. Yes and no. Um, should you be really doing mail server on port 25 over, you know, clear over the wire? No. All right, um, there's no encryption. It's clear text. Everything over the network is just there for anybody to sniff. Uh, Telnet didn't provide any authentication mechanism. So when you Telnet to a box and it asks you for a password, that's not Telnet asking you for the password. That's some other program, login D or some other custom login process. SSH provides more than that. Um, who's used RSH or those remote shell services? Okay, so that was the next step up from Telnet. And that, again, was an attempt to get better security, but not really. It provided uh, authentication mechanisms. You could say which hosts could connect over RSH. Um, not good. Oh, I'm going to demo this because uh, Wireshark is my friend. Yeah, let's bring up Wireshark. There it is. Okay, so this is a Wireshark capture I did at work, and I use Telnet at work. Um, we have some old serial concentrators that only work over Telnet. Um, here is a. Has anyone used Wireshark before? I'm assuming some people have. This is a packet dump. So I ran a program called TCP dump, and I collected everything that went across the network in the lab and displayed here. The, my desktop is 17.5, and the serial server is 17.8. And you can see I've got SSH sessions running. Like this one is an SSH session, and it's encrypted. I can't read that. Then there's a Telnet session opening up right here. And if we look down in the down here in the hexadecimal down the bottom, this junk, if we go down through a few Telnet packets, oh, we start to see some ASCII text. Look, username. Hmm. Somewhere in here is going to be a password. All right, I'll cut, cut this short. If you go up to, uh, where is it, analyze, follow TCP stream. This will just pull out just the Telnet traffic between my desktop and the serial server and show you what the text is. Can everyone see that? It's 
It's a bit small. I don't know how to make this larger. But we basically have here um, you know, a username prompt, uh, my username going in, admin. And you're getting double characters, but you can work that out. <sighs> password. Look what the password is. Default password is admin. Yay. And we're into the serial server at this point. And you can capture, if, you, if I did more on this Telnet system, you'd see all that output and all my characters. So not good. Don't use it. Well, don't use it if you don't have to. All right, so let's just quickly run through basic usage. You've all been here. SSH to somewhere, right? OK, I've got to type in a password. And we're in. Yay. OK, so if you want to log in as somebody else, so you probably didn't notice in that previous example, when I logged in to the remote system right here, it shows me my username. So it logged me into example.com as Bill, which is my username on my laptop. If we want to log in as somebody else, you type in Fred. Asks for Fred password. And we're now logged in as Fred. Yay. Got it? Good. All right. Some people want to be able to script stuff, or they just want to run a single command on the remote server. So again, we'll do that as Fred. We'll run uptime. It runs uptime on the remote server. The standard output is brought back across the SSH connection onto my, you know, and displayed on my terminal. And I'm back in my laptop shell. Simple. So you can use that to write scripts. Uh, if you want a script that goes out, fetches something from another machine, and comes back, and it uses input into something else, great. All right. SCP. Everyone's used SCP, I think. Do I need to demo it? Probably not. Um, so top example, I'm, I'm sending a file from my desktop or my laptop to the remote server. Um, and the other one is copying back the other way. So I want to fetch a file from the other side. Yeah, that's good. All right, recursively. So SCP minus R, I will pull, that's probably not a good example. Um, I will pull a folder from the other site from example.com, I can pull a whole directory tree across to my machine. And there's other tools you can use to do, do that as well, but SCP is there, so people use it. You can put in command line options here to preserve the file, uh, file modification times. That's, everyone knows that. Oh, I love this font. Oops, OK. Back up. Some people don't know that you can limit the bandwidth of your secure copy <coughs> transfers. If you're at home and your wife's watching Netflix, you don't really want to make her buffer because she gets angry. Or he gets angry, whichever. So in this example, I've got the minus L. I'm limiting it to 10, should be 10 kilobits a second. And everyone in the household is happy. SSH file system. Who's used it? SSHFS. Oh, less than half. OK. Who finds that they want to access their files on another machine and they want to open up LibreOffice or some other application and access that file and not have to worry about copying it to your, you know, to your current machine and then copying it back when you're finished? SSHFS is the way to go. This will mount, uh, you create a directory on your local machine, and then you mount your remote directory on your local directory, and you can change directory into it. You can do an ls and list all the files in that directory. You can copy from our documents, in this case, you can copy everything from our documents to your local machine if you wanted to. 
or you can open up your file explorer, whatever file exploring tool you're using, and just wander down through the directory structure. And it'll work from here to work or here to the other side of the country. Question. So the big thing is instead of using uh, NFS, this is getting encrypted. This is encrypted. So you know you know that the host that you're talking to is correct because it authenticates the host and it authenticates you as a user and encrypts everything. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know. You might be able to. This is a user space file system as opposed to a kernel space file system. So um, I don't know. Yeah. Not part of OpenSSH, but it's one of the tools that I always install when I install OpenSSH. So yeah, it's not one of the normal tools. To unmount the directory again, you have to use f user mount. Instead of mount, you have to use f user mount because it's a user space file system. Uh, and then you can delete the directory, that the local directory stub, the R document stub, uh, when you're done. Post keys. All right, so this is one of the advantages I think SSH has over most other things is you've got full host authentication. Um, when you connect to a remote site and that site has changed somehow, it will warn you. It will say you are trying to connect to a machine that is no longer what it used to be. So when you install OpenSSH on a machine, it will generate a host key for that machine, a unique key uh, that identifies that machine so that when you connect to it, when, when SSH opens a connection to that host, it asks, it, gets, it asks for the host key, gets the host key back, and compares it with the host key that it has for that, for that domain name or that IP address. And if they're different, um, it tells you. So the first time you connect to a remote system, it's going to say, this is the host key's fingerprint. Do you want to accept it? Most people just go, yes without thinking about it. But if somebody was doing a man in the middle attack on you, they would be prepared for that. And they would be giving you back their host key and transparently connecting to your actual remote host that you're trying to get to. Nancy. Um, OK, so the question was, if the site is moving from IPv4 to IPv6, will this change? And um, it shouldn't change. The host key will remain the same, but the IP address that you're connecting to may change. So if you're SSHing to an IP address and you SSH to an IPv6 address, you know, a new IPv6 address, um, the local known hosts file is indexed by IP address. So it'll say, oh, this is a new IP address. Let's go fetch that. And it treats it as a new host. If you use a domain name and it connected via IPv4 in the old way, and then it connected via IPv6 in the new way, it would still match as the host name, and you wouldn't see any change here. So if you don't know what the host key fingerprint is of the host server that you're connecting to, you can print it out. And here's the command at the bottom to print out that host key. So when you spin up a new VM, um, so you're spinning up a Linode VM. I'm assuming there's some way for Linode to tell you what the host key is. Otherwise, you're just blindly trusting that your first connection is going to be OK and everything else is good. But All right, so let's move on to your keys. So your keys are associated with your account and your authorization to access that remote system. Um, keys are replacing, the key replaces the password. So when you normally, when you connect to, do an SSH connection to a remote system and it asks you for a password, it's an encrypted link at that stage. You type in your password, it sends your password over to the other side and uses the authentication mechanism on the other system, whether it's PAM or something else, to make sure that password gives you access to the system. 
your password's going somewhere else. You may not trust it. So use a key instead. So using a public-private key, and your key, your private key is never transmitted over the network. Does that make sense to everybody? It's safer. Um, your private key can be locked with a passphrase, which is like a password, but it can be longer. Um, you can also create a private key without a passphrase. So when you want to use that key, you don't have to type anything in. And I'll get to that soon. The command is SSH keygen, and that will generate, that's just by itself, that will generate a new key. By default, it's going to call it ID RSA. Um, you can specify where you want that, what you want to call that key. You can put comments inside that key, um, and it will store it under your .ssh directory by default. OK, so who remembers the days of hand copying SSH keys to other hosts? Yeah. So to access, an, access a remote host using a public-private key, you need to have the private key on your host, on your desktop, and you need your public key to be on the remote system. So you need a mechanism to get it there. Uh, if you're using a cloud service, they usually give you a way of, when you, when you create a new VM, they give you a way of pasting your public key into a dialog box for the, on their web console, and it puts it into your account and sets it up for you. If you're building your own systems or you want to do it, uh, if you've got you know, a Linux server that you've brought up at work and you just want to push your key across to it, SSH copy ID will send it across. You'll have to type in a password to, to do it, but one password's better than every time. Um, if, you have, if you have a way of getting onto the console, you could go across and copy the key in by hand. Um, so if you're really paranoid, yeah, you could do that. You can also copy over. You can, you can, with the key system, you can start to, uh, you can start to compartmentalize authentication between different servers. So you can say, I'm going to use this key with this passphrase to talk to my work servers, and I'm going to use this key to talk to my, my personal website. And you don't have to use the same key for everything. You can, you can break it up and use separate keys. You can have a separate key for every single host that you want to talk to, which would be really cool, because then if one key gets compromised, you don't lose access to everything, or they don't gain access somebody compromises your key, they don't gain access to everything. Right, so the comment there is that if you have too many keys, the default in an SSH server is after four key, after four failed key attempts, it kicks you out of the connection. So if you've got 10 keys in your key file, in your key directory, it will try each key first, and then it'll try the password. But if it's tried four and they've failed, it'll never actually ask you for your password to log in. It kicks you out. And I've got a solution to that. OK, so uh, let's go create a key here. So SSH. OK, so it's going to say, where do I want to save the key file? And I'm going to create one. Oh, OK, I've already created it, so I'm not going to create it again. But you get the picture. <coughs> OK, so if you want to use that particular key file that you've created, Inside the SSH directory, there's actually two files. There's uh, an example RSA, which I created, and an example RSA pub, which is your public key. Your public key, you can spread around on insecure hosts.
without too much hassle or too much worry. Now, uh, I'm going to use that key to try and connect to example.com. It's not going to work, I don't think, because... Okay, so it tried to use the key, but example.com didn't recognize it, and so it's asking me for a password. So kill that. SSH copy ID. If you don't specify the particular key you want to copy with SSH copy ID, it'll copy all of them. Could be bad. Yeah, it'll, this will only transfer the pub because it knows what it's doing. Um, it will also set up the it'll also set up the directory permissions correctly uh, on example.com to make sure this works, and it didn't work. My bad. Fail. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> uh, why didn't that work? No. I didn't specify the key that I wanted to use to authenticate. And because it's a because I created this key and called it example.rsa, it's not the default name and it will try the default password, sorry, the default key and if that doesn't work it'll then just try the default um, it looks like it's just going to try the default password after that. Okay. So, if you notice there I had to type in my passphrase for the key, and it's password, because that's the most common password ever used, and we're in. But, let's get out of here. Okay, notice how every time I tried to log in with that key, it asked me for my passphrase, and that gets repetitive, that gets really repetitive. So, uh, this is where the key agent comes in handy. The key agent runs on your laptop or your desktop and it keeps the keys. You unlock a key and you stick it in that key agent and it will manage them. It, so when you make an SSH connection out, it will, uh, the SSH will, will ask the key agent, do you have this key? It will say, yes, it's unlocked, here it is. And you don't have to type your passphrase in over and over again. So SSH add dot SSH, and I'm just going to add example.rsa, password to unlock it, and it's now in the SSH agent. So if I list, I'm just listing the keys that are in the agent on my laptop, and there's one key, there's the fingerprint, and now if I do an SSH to example.com, bang, we're in. Simple. But wait, there's more. All right, things are starting to get complicated, right? No, yes. Feedback. Less typing, more work. That's what everyone likes, right? Um, so, SSH config. For each host that you want to connect to, you can create a host entry in the config file, and you can specify all the options that you were specifying on the command line. So you can say that when I, for example, when I connect to example.com, I don't want to log in as my username. I want to log in as Fred. And I want to use my example.rsa key. So less typing. Let's demo that. Let me get rid of Wireshark again. Yeah. Because who wants to remember what key you need to use to access what host? And who wants to type in .ssh every time? OK. So one I prepared earlier. Now, I think I need to copy the ID across to Fred. Just be able to do example.com. So at this point, it should uh, should copy it across as Fred. Yep, good. 
Okay, so now I've gone and told SSH copy ID to move my key across to Fred's account. So it's now in Fred's account. It's also in my bill account. SSH example.com bang, I'm now in as Fred. Using keys uh, that are in my key agent. Now, I think my next slide is going to say, yeah. So instead of writing out this whole full command line with your key, specifying your key, and specifying the username at example.com, it's just sshexample.com. But wait, there's more. Tab completion. Nothing. Come on. So, exactly, but, oh, come on, work. Thank you. So, see that? I type in EX, I press the tab key, I'm done. So, tab completion for SSH will use your host, your Etsy host file, um, but it'll also use anything you create in your config file. So if you don't like typing in, if you don't like example.com, but you want to call it, you know, fancy pants, right? I've now created the same host for example.com and fancy pants, and I think this will work. Going off script here. Nope. Okay. I'm wrong. No, it's probably because fancy pants doesn't resolve to example.com. Okay, so you're saying down here, host name? Yeah. Mmm, I learned something great. Woohoo! Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, who doesn't use bash here? Okay. <laughs> I mean, I grew up with T shell and C shell, and then Bash came along, and I'm good. <laughs> All right. X Windows tunneling. Who wants to run an X Windows program on your remote machine and display it on your local machine? Who's done it without SSH before? We're using X hosts. Yeah, okay. Now, imagine trying to use, so Xhost does unencrypted uh, X Windows TCP communication, which is built into T X Windows and has been forever. Um, but if you're going through a firewall and maybe through a NATed system, you'd have to open up ports all the way along the way to get it to work. And then using Xhosts, which is not really secure. Yuck. Uh. That was my, what was my example? It was minus x, yeah, thank you. Okay, so we'll log into example.com as Fred and run x eyes. So this is an X Windows application running on Fred and you can see it's getting, it's got transparency, X has had that for a long time. There's no, in this case there's no um, window bordering or anything like that because uh, XIS doesn't have it. And this is running over a, uh, a low bandwidth link, a well, lowish bandwidth, it's probably one megabit link. And it works. Um, it's not the best once you get the latencies, once, once the latencies of your network connection go up, it starts to suck. And then you want to use something else like VNC. Um, but you can run, you know, xcalc. You can type, type in stuff, you know, plus three five equals. It works. That is that is just so much simpler than the old way of doing things. Question. Uh, 
Why? No. Uh, I'm running Linux on my on my laptop. Oh, That's got the uh, okay yeah, X server running, and that is the client displaying on the server. All right. Port tunneling. People put up firewalls, and then they open up special gaps to let certain traffic through, like this one. That's my mum, by the way. So firewalls are there to protect your network, but they shouldn't get in the way of doing work. Um, and depending on your IT department, you may or may not be allowed to do this stuff. If it's your home router, you can do whatever you like because you run it. Um, your home, it's generally on your home router, you can open up a port for SSH. You can open up port 22, let stuff through. But you may want to tunnel through your router, through your NAT, and get access to services that are running inside your uh, inside your network from outside. Um, a good example is if you want to access your internal web server from work. You might run an internal web server at home. I run Myth TV, so I have Myth TV running inside my network. Um, it has Myth Web, so it displays a web page internally, which lets me set what pro what TV shows to record or you know who's currently watching TV, that sort of stuff. I don't let that out through the firewall. So I create an SSH tunnel through my router um, into my home network. And then I can fire up my web browser at work, point it at a local port at work on my local machine, and it will tunnel all the traffic through the network, through my encrypted SSH tunnel, so the IT guys can't see what I'm doing, and access my home web server. Nice. So this command here, we're doing uh, a forwarding, a port forwarding system where anything on my laptop, if I connect to port 8080 on my laptop, it will forward it to the local host port 80 at the remote end. Local host just means that the box, that the remote system that you've logged into, it's going to connect to it, to that port 80 on that machine. You can specify an IP address here, so if you SSH into your home router, if you're running OpenWRT, you can SSH in, and then you could say port forward it not to localhost, but port forward it to 192.168.0.15, which could be your media center. Great. Who does that? Anyone do it? Yeah, we've got a few. Okay. Reverse port forwarding. Anyone do that? It's a little bit more conceptually tricky, but basically you're opening a SSH tunnel through to the remote machine, and then you are listening, telling that remote machine to listen on a port, and any connections to that port, bring it back up the tunnel, and send it off to the machine that you specify. So in this case, I've specified localhost port 22. So I'll run this at work on my desktop. I will SSH into home and open a port, in this case, 2022 at home, and then when I get home at night, I type SSH port 22, sorry, 2022, and it will forward my SSH connection back up the tunnel and let me log in to my work machine without having to open up ports on the firewall at work. Fun. Exactly. You can write a script. You could use any other. There's numerous tools to keep something alive like that. Um, but yeah, you could put in a while do loop if you really wanted to. Um, yeah, and I'm not in this talk. I'm not trying to give you all the answers. I'm trying to excite you and say, go home, try this. Use some of the other command line options. There's other options like TCP keep alive. 
which means it will send a packet occasionally down the link to make sure that nobody drops that link on you. I didn't cover that. Remote browsing. Um, Sox proxy, anyone heard of Sox proxy? Yeah, OK, good. SSH has the dynamic port forwarding for Sox proxy built in. So you can connect. Sox proxy is, is a, I don't know how to describe it. Um, basically, you use it if you are deployed overseas or you're trying to access, yeah, let's say you're deployed overseas and you want to access Netflix. But Netflix says, no, 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 you can't access me from Iraq because it's geo-locked. They don't want to share the media. They don't want to stream the media outside of their copyright region. So you can do a SOX proxy connection to a server in the US, and then you configure your web browser to use the proxy server, and everything goes across an SSH encrypted tunnel, and your web browser in Iraq appears to be located in America. Poor man's VPN. Yes. Right. So I'll repeat that. The only the downside of using SOX proxy is your application needs to support SOX protocol uh, or SOX facility. And uh, if you use a VPN, then there is no restriction. Any application will work with it. Question. Does it? Yes. So I'll repeat that. Uh, apparently, the user at your remote site needs to be authorized or has the access to set up the SOX proxy um, on that box. So, you, you know, if it's your home machine, you're fine. Question? One thing to notice this process alone does not forward DNS queries. Uh -huh. All right. So this does not forward your, your DNS queries over the, over the SSH tunnel. So your DNS is still going to go out unencrypted to the DNS server that you've got on your local network or, or that you've chosen to use. Um, if your application doesn't have SOX built in, and Firefox and Chromium do, uh, there are tools that attempt to wrap up the application. So there's, um, I'm not going to, basically you run uh, this tool and then the application that you want to run and it will intercept all of the network communication and push it across the SOX, uh, SOX proxy connection. That's for you to do at home. All right. Control master. Who's used control masters? Okay, so we've got about four people here who've used control master. This basically as I said, multiplex is your SSH connection. You create, when you, do a, when you do your first SSH connection to a remote machine, and any, any future SSH connections to that machine will get pushed through your original tunnel. And you don't have to spend the time setting up, SSH doesn't have to waste its time doing a key exchange and authenticating the host. Um, so it's really quick. You fire up your initial one, it's going to be slow to, to initiate the connection. Every subsequent SSH connection to that machine is quick, quick, quick. I don't know how to do it on the command line. I haven't even looked. I stick all this in my config file and forget about it. The real advantage is if you are running a script that goes out to the remote machine and grabs, you know, runs a command and gets the result and does something with it and then sends off another command, you can issue them as separate SSH uh, commands in your bash script or your Perl script or whatever. And as long as you've got that initial connection, that initial tunnel established between the, the two sites, that script's going to just run, run, run really quick. Caveat, if you close the first connection, the master connection, all your slaves are going to die. Joseph. Control persist. Control persist. So there's a way to make the control channel stay alive even if you'd close it. For some period of time. 
Okay. And again, another another useful config file option. So I have this in my config file, and I don't even think about it now. I just leave it in there, and whenever I connect, it creates a master channel. And yeah, question. Right. So the, the question or the statement is that if you do have this in your config file and you use it, some of the options, other options, will be ignored. And one of them is, uh, for example, if you set up a uh, port forward in your config file or you use a port forward uh, on the command line and you try to do that on a slave connection, the master's already set up port forwards. It's already doing that. It won't, it'll just ignore that that new port forward. It won't establish another port forward. Okay, I said before, you can create a key without a passphrase to unlock it. Just dangerous. Very dangerous. If you have a key that doesn't have a pass, passphrase and it's on your work machine, your sysadmin can come along, log into your work machine. He's got root access. He can grab your private key file and connect to your remote machines, right? So you've now given your admin access to your home server or to stuff he probably shouldn't have access to. But if you're writing a script that you put in a cron job, your cron job can't ask you to enter in the passphrase every time it tries to connect to the remote machine. So. That's where, and you don't want to have, you, I've seen people do this, they do an echo of the password into SSH to get the SSH connection to unlock, and <laughs> now that's wrong, right? That's defeating the purpose. Use Telnet at that point. <laughs> so SSH has a authorized keys file on the remote system, and inside there, that's usually just containing your public key that says when somebody connects with, with this key, let them in. You can specify that when they connect, they cannot do X11 forwarding. They can't do other, you know, no port forwarding, for example. But you can also specify a command. And if you specify a command, they can't run anything else. They don't get a shell. Whenever they connect, it runs that command. And I'm doing a, a, an email, you know, connect to the SNMPT, SM SMTP server to send email, but you could specify uptime in, as the command, and every time they hit hit that, you know, make that connection, they get back uptime, and that's all they get. So if you're running if you're writing a script that's going to connect and get uptime, just put it on the remote, you know, on the remote system. Just say if this this key connects, they get uptime, and that's it. You could run something a lot more complicated than that, but. <coughs> hey, I did current control master. All right, keyboard tricks. Question. What I'm understanding from that is, if you have one cron job that you just want to run without having to put a password in, you can go in the remote machine and put what that cron job is, so that when you trigger the cron job. Yeah, the cron job can just do sshexample.com, and or actually you have to. You probably have to specify in the cron job, you'd have to specify um, the key file to use and the username and stuff like that. But yeah, when it does the SSH, it'll just run that command and get that back as standard input. So they would have to hack the script on the other machine if they want to. They'd have to get access to the other machine and actually change the script, yeah. Or change, change this authorized key file. And everything inside the SSH directory on the remote machine is read, read, Read writable only by the user. If it's if SSH server looks at your .ssh directory in your home directory and sees that there that you've given access to group or other, it won't use it. it it'll it'll just say no. I'm not going to let anyone connect at this point. Yeah, it's not secure. So. I don't know. I'm pretty sure because I've set up our, our system. Okay, so, so the 
statement is if it doesn't match the beginning of the command, it may let yeah, it. But I mean, right, whatever command you use on the SSH command line has to match the first part of that. You okay. So uh, if, you, if you have a command like NC specified, um, it will, what we're saying is it will let you specify command line options for NC, but you're only going to be able to run NC in this example. All right, control D, log out. Everyone should know that because everyone's mistyped it at some point and logged out of your current shell. Control D works over SSH, it'll log you out of your current shell. Um, if your SSH connection gets stuck for whatever reason, um, tilde dot enter, and that will kill your SSH connection. So that's like the escape character. Question? It's enter tilde dot. Like enter tilde dot. Thank you. I just keep pressing enter, tilde dot, enter, <laughs> tilde dot, enter. <laughs> Bang, it's out. All right. This one got me for a while. Um, I use other applications that use control S to save. And so <laughs> finger memory, I do control S by accident in the SSH session, and then I type and nothing happens. And it's basically, it's really just locked the TTY. So, and at that point I go tilde dot, tilde dot, and try and kill the SSH session and I have to reestablish. Um, it's actually easy to fix. You just do control Q, it unlocks the TTY session, and everything's good. You want an example? Example to come. Control S. Now I can't type. Control Q unlocks and there's all my typing. Yay. All right, let's get tricky. We've got a few minutes left. Just. You want to clone your hard drive on your Linode machine. You can use SSH to run DD on your Linode machine, pipe the standard output back to your, your machine. I run it through PV, because PV gives you process or pipe viewer. It shows you the progress of your transfer. And then you can write it to a file, or you can write it to gzip and tar or whatever else you like. The caveat is if you're trying to do if you're trying to do something as root on the other system, you need to use sudo. Sudo is going to ask you for a password. So in this example, I've told it to use sudo ask pass. So when sudo needs to use a password, it runs that program. In this case, it's x11 ssh ask pass, and it pops up a dialog. But that's running on the right machine. So you need to forward X connection back to your local machine so that that password dialog appears on your local machine. <laughs> and then we're good. Did you do that because you wouldn't use standard Yes, because uh, standard out is being piped and you don't see it. So, because it's standard error, I think. I'm not sure. But it didn't work, so yes. Okay, so the statement is the VTY is locked um, because of what we're doing and you can't enter a standard password. I don't think you can even echo one through to try and, but that'd be bad. Okay, so you can force it, but it doesn't always work? Okay. Um, VNC, who uses VNC? Yeah, that's better. I'm not using this hard. Uh, desktop thing. Good. Um, VNC has SSH, uh, the ability to use SSH built in, but you need to set up an environment variable that tells VNC how to, where to push its, its network traffic through. Um, so in this case, I am connecting as Fred. So I'm going to run SSH, I'm going to connect as Fred. Uh, I'm going to do a port forward with the minus L and SSH will fill in these variables with the correct ports that it wants to use, the host name that you're going to connect to, and then I run sleep on the other end just to keep the connection alive 
long enough for you to establish a VNC connection, and then the traffic will keep the, the tunnel alive. And then VNC Viewer, you just say, do it via example.com. So this creates an SSH tunnel to your remote machine, and then connects to the VNC server running on that local machine. And I use that to admin my parents' machine in Australia. Great. All right, we're at the end. Go home. Um, before you go home, there's some extra things that you might want to know. SSH LF, LH, LF. I think it's LH. But um, you can, if your firewall, say at the university, blocks all connections except port 80 and port 443, <coughs> so HTTPS connections, you can run SSH LF on your server and it will interpret the traffic coming in and say, this is SSL, I'm going to send that to the web browser, sorry, to the web server, or this is an SSH connection, I'm going to send it to OpenSSH. So now you can connect with your web browser to your home machine and you'll over, over HTTPS and you'll get your web page or SSH to your home machine and you're in. Uh, SSH ask pass pops up a nice pretty GUI for you to enter in your passphrase because you might be setting up a machine for somebody who is not a command line person. You can create an icon on the desktop, shortcut icon, you double click it, it runs an SSH command to, you know, to another machine to, I don't know, say fire up an X, X11 program, but how do you get the passphrase in? How do you unlock the key? So you can specify a program that it pops up to ask you for that, that passphrase. KDE has a, uh, a KIO plugin, they call it. It's called Fish. So anywhere in KDE that you specify a file path or a URL, you can type in fish and username at example.com and it will make an SSH connection and give you seamless, you know, as if you're talking to a file on a local system. Read write. Just like SSH FS, file system, but built into KDE. Vert Manager. Who uses KVM? Vert Manager. Okay. That has SSH connection built in. Quick. Let's do it. Root manager. File, add connection. Connect to remote host. Oh, look, I can specify SSH. I'm not going to do it, but. It, um, but it, this will create a new entry. It'll connect via SSH. It'll appear like this one here, quad. This is my other machine. And it. You can double click on that and it'll connect to that remote server running KVM server and it'll display all the clients, whether they're running or not running. You can click on a client and it will display the client's console over VNC, over the SSH tunnel on your desktop. But you don't have to think about it, you just configure it once and forget about it. That's it. Any questions? I have a lab full of those boards, full of test machines, JTAG programmers. Um, I have uh, remote power switching, so I can power cycle those boards. Um, all the boards have got serial ports. Some of them have got Ethernet. So I SSH into a test server, and I can run tests on that against that board. Um, I can SSH into that board. That board's running Linux. So I can SSH into it over Ethernet, run test commands, um, you know, run a load, you know, run some sort of burn-in load program, make sure the board's working, have other Linux test servers, you know, checking the temperatures, doing whatever else. And I do all that in the lab at work. I don't want to walk from my office to the lab every five minutes every time I need to type, you know, run a new test. I just do it all from my desktop. And then when we have a snow day, hey, hey Armageddon, um, I don't go into work. I just stay at home. And I just remote control a SSH into my work machine and remote control everything from there.
and I don't need anything special on the firewall to do so. Question? Yeah, I'm going to, uh, I believe I need to send these to the conference organizers and they will put them up. So these slides will become available uh, at the end of the conference. Any more questions? All right, well, that's time. Thank you very much. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.